Good morning, Gary. Thank you very much for coming to have a chat to me today on the Insurance Brokers Podcast. It's really lovely to have you here. Morning, Sarah. It's my pleasure. A little bit early, but still looking forward to it. The earlier, the better for me, I think. My brain functions up until about 2 p.m. and then it's over. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I thought it'd be really interesting um, to have a chat with you on the podcast mm. to talk about your background, South Essex insurance brokers, what you're doing, what your plans are, what your um, uh, growth aims are, and just to give everybody sort of an overview of Gary. So um, how about we start with telling me a bit about yourself and your background and how you came to end up where you are. Obviously, you're not oh. from Essex. No, clearly not. No, no you <laughs> tell it from the accent. Uh, yeah, no problems. Um, well, I've been in the insurance game um, more than half my life. So like most people in 25 years in the game, find myself in it sort of by accident one day because I wanted a job in an office uh, somewhere nice and warm. I've been working outside all summer. Um, so yeah, no, I was a high street insurance broker for, for a few years. Um, found myself through a couple of redundancies as, as many as we've been through in, in, in this market. Um, in uh, in an insurer so i went to work for for axa so i went from broker to insurer spent a good 10 years or so um axa aig cna hsb had some great years um, learning the ropes in some of the major insurers um was lucky enough to work in the lloyd's market for a couple of years as well with with city net on the on the development side so got to understand some of the challenges and the fun sides of working in the in the city um but yeah i worked down moved down to um to london with hsb to be regional manager uh, the London business, their international book, um, and then like loved it down here and, and chose to stay and uh, found myself somehow out in, in South Essex uh, earlier this year, which has been a, a fantastic move for me so far. So how long have you been at South Essex? I joined in, in February um, this year, so it felt like forever sort of uh, getting on board. I was doing some consulting before I uh, I came along, but joined fully in, uh, in February. And it's uh, obviously an interesting time to join, having uh, you know a couple of months um, in the office and then everything went a little bit pear-shaped as we know. Yeah, absolutely. How did you find that process? Because obviously joining any new firm is, you know, great, fun, exciting. And that's sort of been taken away by COVID? Um, to be fair, no, it's probably added to it in, in some ways. It sounds a bit a bit bizarre, but I think, you know, you, you learn more about any business and yourself a little bit as well in, in, in a time of difficulty. And I think, you know, it would have been quite a simple transition into, you know, a, a, a fairly understandable business in, in, in SEIB, but I think, you know, it's, it's so, so much easier, I guess, to learn about the challenges and the things that we really faced uh, by seeing it in, in a point of, I guess, you know, real change and, and you know, and the significant um, issues that businesses just never face and didn't, you know, weren't prepared for. So I think, you know, those first few uh, first few weeks were a little bit reactive, I guess, you know, we did everything we, we possibly could to um, ultimately to be able to service our customers. Um, that was a, the real challenge for us, but we weren't set up for people to work at home. I think we only had a, a handful of laptops. There's 130 people now in the SEIB business. Um, and across those, we literally had a handful of laptops, a handful of mobile phones. You know, we're heavily reliant on, on inbound telephone traffic into our, our sales teams and our, our servicing teams. Um, within the space of a week, we'd turn around where we had about 60% of the business up and running and live and, and over time more and more and more. And, you know, until the, the most recent announcements, we were getting pretty much all of our customer facing teams back in, in the office. And I think um, we're now dispersed again, as, as you'd expect, and our non-customer facing teams are, are, are based at home. And we've just been, you know, we've learned a lot about our business and learned a lot about ourselves through that time. But, you know, the teamwork, the morale, the energy in the business has, has been second to none. And I think that's that's been the thing that you've seen in, in the really good businesses. Uh, and we've seen lots of those out there um, that have really, really sort of, mucked in and, and just just grafted through it and i think it's taken that it's taken real hard work um it's really taken leadership as well which which we've had um and that's been been great um and we just had to make some calls and run with it a little bit and i think it's you know we've learned a lot about ourselves and and actually the results have been have been really really solid through that time to a point now where we find ourselves at the I was going to say the back end of it, but obviously we're not into the, the sort of next stage of it where we find ourselves recruiting and bringing new bodies on, on board, which is which is tremendous, really, given where we thought we might be in, uh, in March. That is that's absolutely incredible. Um, what is your role within? Uh, so I know your learning and development. What what does that entail and how how have you had to what areas within that particular role have you seen within South Essex and, and been able to develop? 
Sure. Well, it's uh, our role is trading and development. So anything that is effectively um, customer facing, so anything that I manage the sales teams, the commercial teams, motor trade, question underwriting, various different parts of, of the business that, that sort of fit together. But effectively, anything that's that's trading, anything that's customer facing, um, anything that's that's revenue generating and insurer relationships and markets would come into myself. Um, and I have an overview for for the business, and it's it, it's been it's been a challenge. I think you know the. The revenue generating bit has, has been around, you know, the worry with, with some of the schemes and facilities that we have uh, in those more leisure sort of trades and, and areas that were going to be hugely impacted initially by by the COVID pandemic. We've, um, you know, we were a little bit concerned about up front, but I think what we saw in terms of drop off in those first couple of months, we've seen come back to us. We've got that great customer loyalty and people buy the service and the ethos and, and the experience of SEIB have come back to us. So, so where we saw initial drop offs, we've, we've seen that come back. Um, the customer service part was a challenge, obviously, just in terms of, of maintaining that. And I think, generally speaking, the, the client, the customer has been fantastic through this. I think, you know, we've, we've had a job to educate and to bring people along. And I think we've done a tremendous job um, in terms of digital marketing and just, just connecting with our, our customers really through that time, as well as what the teams are doing on, on the phone. So they bet, you know. They waited, they sort of bore with us a little bit for the first few weeks while it was really, really challenging. But, you know, retention's been as as, as high as ever and, and new business is, is good. So things have gone well. I think probably the most challenging thing has been has been the markets. They've just been engaging with, the, you know, a lot of the, the composites and the major insurers where, you know, everyone's gone through this period of change. Some have dealt with it tremendously well and some haven't. Um, and that's been the biggest issue for us, I think, is that, you know, what we found is, you probably ended up doing more business with nimble MGAs into Lloyd's markets and, and those kind of players where they've been open for business, they've had an appetite and you've been able to get older people and, and actually you've, you've built much stronger relationships through this. Whereas I think some insurers have probably damaged their reputation relationships a little bit through this time by just not wrapping themselves around the brokers and thinking um, a bit too insular. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that time and time again over the last six months. It's been, um, it's not been an easy, uh, uh, an easy uh, six months by any means in that respect. And one of the podcasts I did was with Ian Lloyd from iPrism, mm. and um, that was that was that was a really good uh, chat as well. And we were talking about the. I made up a new word called nimbility, the nimbility of uh, of the smaller MGAs and how yeah. actually that could be a good direction to get through um, a lot of what's probably coming. Just on that, um, so many things you've just said that I've thought of questions for. I've forgotten half of them already. Um, so just on that, you guys have, so you guys are very well known as the equestrian uh, broker. and yeah. uh, But actually that's not all you do. You've got 16 different specialisms um and we've obviously talked previously about um the marketing and the sales aspect of each of those different uh, mm. specialisms what i want to ask is how do you maintain the specialist nature of your brand when um at, and stop it coming into sort of a generalist <laughs> with so many specialisms um that's, that's a really good point. I think, um, I think the 16 is from our, our business cards where we talk about being specialists and, and obviously we mentioned all our specialisms and it does make us sound a little bit generalist. But I think we are a mix of, of both. There's almost a couple of businesses within within SCIB, Sarah. And I think the you know we've got a really strong commercial general open market business as well, which perhaps we don't shout enough about. Um, and that's definitely an area that we've seen some real progress and growth in um, too. Just being the local broker for, for our clients in Ockenden and South Essex. Um, which isn't a particularly overbroked area, actually. So we, we do find that we've got that. But the specialist um, nature is, I think, what we are fantastic at doing is, if you start about marketing there, is, is sort of, and this comes from not just a year or two working these specialisms, it's 20 years, 50 years, in, in some cases, in the equestrian side, of really wrapping ourselves around um, the clients and, and the customers and, and the everyone really in, in in those spaces so from a question perspective for instance you know we've, we've run our um, search for a star event 26 years now which is um links to the uh, horse of the year show so um that's something that you see seib you see our brand in horse and hound magazine on a, on a weekly basis you see our brand all over the equestrian world you know we are absolutely knitted into into that space we ensure some of the biggest equestrian membership groups um in the in the country and i think you talk to people about insurance in, in the equestrian world, then SEIB is, is a very, very familiar brand. 
Um, and that's really through, through longevity and through effort and passion, actually, as well. I think one of the things that really comes across at SEIB is you're dealing with experts. Uh, and that was one of the things that really drove me towards this, this business. I mean, I knew nothing about equestrian insurance before I joined. And um, the, the guys and girls that we have in our team are so passionate about that. We've got a number of people in this business. In fact, it's a high percentage that own horses, that are passionate, that, that ride, that race, that, that show jump and various different things. And it's it really comes across in what we do. So we understand, you know, from a, from a customer perspective, I think it's not just talking a good game, it's actually really understanding and showing that. But equally, in, in the feudal director world, we've worked with Barry, set that relationship up. We've been the broker for the National Association of Feudal Directors now for 30 years, I think it's 20, 30 years. Um, and we've had a great relationship at top and down to uh, individual um, funeral directors. Um, level for, for a number of years and again sponsorship support trade shows we just do so much with them and, and again people come to us for advice and support in that world and um, they just they just know it. so again there are real sort of core specialisms but over the last few years again just through hiring good quality people who understand the products so and motor trade for instance is a huge growth area for us we've had a motor trade team now for a, a few years and we've got some of the best motor trade people in the market um, ex insurers as well as brokers so we, we do the underwriting at the front end as well so our insurers love us for that because we, we, we run very well uh, managed schemes with great loss ratios our clients love us because it's a great product we offer different quirks we understand those and actually we've hired a guy recently who, who sort of fits the SEIB mold he's just really passionate about the motor trade he's a tinkerer himself and you know he goes to see garages and talks to them about something that he's passionate about so it's not even like it's a job so you know, we continue to develop our, our brand, our marketing, whether that's face-to-face, -face, whether that's digital marketing. We've got um, Nick Hughes, who's been in our marketing team now for a long, long, long time as well. He's so knitted and ingrained in that question world that even if people don't know SCIB, they know um, Nicky McKenzie, which is which is really, really strong as, as well. So, you know, most things here say down to people. I think what I find really interesting, and and like I say, I'm talking to lots and lots of different brokers across all different sizes. And there is, there's a lot of, of community brokers for, for the local area doing um, general uh, uh, commercial insurance. Um, and there are some that have particular specialisms. But what's really come out when we've been talking um, before is about um, how your niche is developed around the internal team that you have. So your niches have come out of experience that you've then built on with each of your individual people. And I think that's really important to talk the talk, walk the walk and yeah. really understand. Um, and it also gives you, it gives you a focus. So a lot of what we're talking to people about um, and what we've talked about is about the, um, the, the integrated sales and marketing infrastructure within your business growth aims. And, and what underpins that is focus. So that's what I find really um, interesting about, you know, the niche schemes, because your focus goes from your, you know, every step of the journey to, to, to doing the events and being involved in, in yeah. you know, horse uh, uh, events and the world. So I think it's incredible. Um, what have you, what have you seen across obviously the leisure industry, but what have you seen across the different specialisms you guys have with, uh, COVID what, what's happening to your customers and how are you servicing it? Now, what the reason I'm asking this question is because generally people that are listening to the insurance broker podcast might be of a smaller size. Cause you guys are obviously, I think you're about 40 million GWP. Are you? That's right. Yeah. Now we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so so they might be of a smaller size with aspirations, and 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 what's really helpful is to hear about sort of the underpinning business uh, aims and thoughts behind. So, what are you seeing in your specific specialis specialisms across COVID, and and what are you doing about it? Okay, so there's been a few a few really good examples. I think if we touch on an obvious one that people always ask us about in this current situation is the funeral directors. It's oh, funeral directors must be tremendously busy. Well, well, actually, it's not necessarily the case. There's been a huge impact on the funeral director um, world that, that a lot of people don't recognise because the average cost of funerals has obviously plummeted um, over the last few months simply because you haven't had the same amount of people attending funerals. It's, it's been a very different affair to a standard funeral where a lot of funeral directors wouldn't just make the money from, you know, the coffins and the actual um, funeral itself. It's from some of the other services that you'd expect to see from the vehicles and limousines. So we've, got, we've seen a lot of vehicles being taken off the road uh, and those kind of challenges and, and their income actually dropping down to some extent in some cases. 
Um, so what we've we've tried to do, we've we've been, I think it's fair to say, leading in in, in this space on that and on other areas such as taxis and couriers, which are other schemes that we have, where we've we've spoken to our insurers literally on day one and said, look, we need to offer something else to these guys. We need to offer laid up cover for some of the vehicles and not just taking things off the road or not having things insured. These are expensive specialist vehicles, but it's understanding the challenges that our funeral director clients would face, our taxi clients would face, our chauffeur clients would, would face. And I think, you know, taxi, whether it's laid up or we've had a number of different taxi providers coming to us, sorry, taxi companies coming to us saying, you know, we're going to do some career work instead of ferrying people around at this time as well. It's just, it's getting in front of that and having a solution in place for them, I think is really important. And how do you get that to filter through? So obviously the vi that's the vision. This is what we're yeah. going to do. This is what we're going to offer. Yeah. How do you get every stage of your, your, your management and your actual client facing staff to be in that mentality? Okay. Well, the, I mean, staff wise, there's, there's obviously a lot of internal engagement on this. And the idea is a great part of, of again, of this business at SEIB. It's, a, it's quite a flat structure. We've got those who are on the front line are, as you know, often the decision makers in the business, they speak to these clients on a daily basis. They understand the challenges they face. They know what's coming up. So from a staff perspective, we've had an awful lot of engagement and the ideas have come from within the business. And from an insurer perspective, we work very, very closely with the, the insurer partners we have on the schemes. We've got some huge partnerships in, in place there. Uh, and again, you know, generally speaking, no problem because what they recognize at SEIB and like most good schemes brokers, is we understand the client, we understand the product better than a lot of the insurers do. So we know the challenges and the niches there, and they're relying on our experience and expertise um, to, to make recommendations and changes. And ultimately then it's about engaging with the clients and whether that's what we have done is, is, is through the COVID situation, we've, we've picked up the phone an awful lot more outbound now to clients. We've spoken to people on a much more regular basis, not just you know your, your standard renewal call, but throughout the cycle, we've engaged with customers much more. Um, and also we've, we've really taken advantage of things like social media, um, digital marketing. You know, we're involved in a number of, of groups on things like Facebook, for instance, where people are talking about these kind of challenges. And as soon as we hear about them, we jump on them and, and we react to that and we're able to help. Or often we've actually got the solution in play and we just make sure that everyone's aware of that. So a lot more customer contact in a lot of different ways, which has been challenging, obviously. And um, hence, I guess we're talking to you guys. But um but yeah, that's 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 something that I think you know we're very very proud of of our marketing department, both print, digital, and and events. Absolutely, and I think, uh, like you say, from our conversations, what you're doing has the focus, and it's got the process, and you've got the right team in place, yeah. and it's just about how do we now maximise that to, to to build on it and and take it from the customer to the prospect to the world, I suppose, yeah. uh, in a very focused way, of course. <laughs> Um, okay, so moving slightly from, from the niche markets that you guys do, I'd like to talk, if it's okay with you, about kind of the infrastructure of, of SEIB because you guys are owned by Ecclesiastical. Yes. And can you talk to me a little bit about any challenges that that might bring with it? And I'm thinking specifically um, AXA's creation of Bluefin and the raised eyebrows that happened there and just that... that possible conflict how do you guys manage it okay uh interesting you say axe from bluefin i was at axe at the time when uh, a bluefin was happening around us and, and yeah it did raise an awful lot of eyebrows and <laughs> there were an awful lot of challenges both internal and in the market actually the perception because it was obviously one of the uh, one of the early ones and i think it did cause a bit of a storm i think it's a bit more normal now i think you know from a, a market perspective it's not seen as as, as such a, a, an issue i think yeah you know, from my perspective i've got to say um, I've been I've been heartened by the relationship that we have with with ecclesiastical. So um, our management team following the buyout stayed on. So the directors are still exactly the same as before, albeit a couple of guys from ecclesiastical obviously sit on on our board. Um, but it's SEIB led business still, and, and all the brokers, the, the the three key brokers and the brokers that that sit underneath those that belong to the ecclesiastical broken family, either wholly or, or part, are exactly the same. We've got really strong management teams in place. Um, you know, very, very successful individuals and groups of people that have created phenomenal businesses and very, very profitable businesses. And we do turn an awful lot of profit for ecclesiastical and underwriter that, you know, in, in this market obviously have their, their own challenges to, to deal with. So um, there's a real sort of hands off in terms of, of how things are generally managed between the, the two businesses, um, but the right kind of support when we need it as well. So we don't report in through to the insurance business, obviously we report through to a separate part of the business 
for some clear walls and, and definition between those. We have a good relationship with Ecclesiastical as, a, as an insurer partner, um, but it's by no means our biggest insurer partner. It's just somebody that we, we use for some of the specialist areas that we that we happen to trade in, um, but they don't fit most of the niches that, that, that we deal with. So, um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, it's a good, solid relationship. It's as hands-off as I think we as an entrepreneurial business need it to be. Um, but it's as hands-on as we also need it to be when it comes to things like looking at broader investments in technology and, and those kind of areas that why would we do that on our own when there's three brokers within the group that between us control, you know, a couple hundred million of, of, of premium. Um, why would we not do those kind of things collectively? So it's it's that really nice balance and sense between the two, I, I think. What's uh, What you've just said there's really interesting. One of the the kind of I suppose the the vision behind the insurance brokers podcast is that as a as a as a as an individual things are hard but as a collective this industry has such an incredible amount of knowledge and expertise and if we can build a community out of that we've got a support network and that's kind of what you guys have built with um Lysitz and Lloyd and White yep. sitting on that board can you tell me a little bit more about sort of the interactions of, of the board, how it's set up, what benefits you get from it and how you support each other? Yeah, so I think, again, you know, these, these things have happened over time and they probably weren't happening as you know early on in the ecclesiastical relationship with, with SCIB and the other brokers. But I think as, as CEOs, they, they engage on a, on a regular basis in, in the business and, and at, at my level between myself and the managing directors of the, of the three um, businesses, we, we engage on, on a regular basis and look at things like markets, trends, challenges, and um, partnerships. Um, you know, we, we're not we're not the kind of brokers that, you know, throw our clouds around in the market too much and, and you you must do this and you must do that. We really value insurer relationships and partnerships and, and rightly so we've got three very distinct businesses there in, in Lloyd and White um, license and ourselves who, who work in in very, very different lines. There's little bits of crossover and you know we we use each other's expertise and value in that. And I think you know we find ourselves engaging on a fairly regular basis. Um, but it's 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 good. It's not competitive, uh, or not too competitive. There's the odd one, obviously, we come across. Um, but no, I think that it's, it's that you mentioned. It's it's expertise, and you know when you've got the expertise of the group that we have, you know the relationships, the sort of people we have in this business. Why would you not lean on them? And I think we're encouraged to do that. And I think Ecclesiastical do a good job of bringing us together and kind of letting us get on with it. Then, so you know, when we're looking at placement strategies. We don't do so much together, but I think perhaps we should do a little bit more. So, you know, if we've got 30 million pounds with an insurer across the three, then perhaps we should be going into the same people and making sure we've got, you know, we've got similar deals and, and those kind of things. So really good conversations. Um, but more than anything, it's more of a knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing. Yeah. I think you're right. It, it, things like this are an iterative process. And just in the time that uh, this podcast has been live, I get probably weekly messages from people saying, hi, you know, I've just listened to episode X and I'm in the similar position and I took a lot from it, gave me a lot of heart. And it's so lovely to be able to share that knowledge and, and support that I think, um, it, I think it's fabulous. I think it's, yeah. I think it's the way the world is more going than it maybe traditionally has been so that that collaboration with possible competitors but actually let's view it as a collaboration opportunity is is really important i suppose that's part of the ethos behind some of the networks that have sprung up and and um and things like that so in terms of of seib and your um kind of growth aims how how do you plan for that given the last eight months how have you gone in this niche I want a 50% yeah. whatever yeah. in the current market. What's the, the logic behind it and the planning process? <laughs> so I think the logic in, in some areas, in certain areas, obviously, we, you know, our growth will be on a much more steady scale because, you know, we're very, very embedded in, in that space. And, and, you know, unless all of a sudden there's a, an extra, you know, 2,000 horse boxes on the road, for instance, you know, we're only going to grow as, as, as much as we can, but at the right kind of pace in there. But some areas, so I'll throw a motor trade in as, as an example, and we've got huge growth aspirations because we've got such a quality team. We've got quality products and quality insurance partners. I think what's what we've seen during this this cycle is some policies, some products have, have not become. I've used the term a few times, COVID proof, but I think I've got to be a bit careful about that. But we've seen retention as high as you know mid nineties up to one hundred percent on some products at different times because actually those businesses are still trading. They still need us. They still need their insurance. Um, 
and they still need their, their partners and probably lean on those partners more than ever because of the work that we've done over the last 10 years plus on, on our motor trade book, for instance, um, we've built some great partnerships, great schemes that we have with insurers. We've made them you know, a reasonable amount of, of profit in that time with solid loss ratios to a point when actually most insurers are looking at rate now as we're stepping into a hardening market. We've seen that obviously in different lines you know, now, but in, in others perhaps less so. But we know after reinsurance and everything else, you know, the one one we'll, we'll start to see more and more. And um, actually, we've got products that we don't necessarily have to throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and start to really increase um, premiums at a, at a silly level. So if we've got competitive products, quality products and great people, and I think I mentioned before, Sarah, we've just invested in more great people. So Motor Trade, as an example, we've brought two more people into the team because we just know that right now that is such a great growth opportunity for us. And I think we're not ignoring the market conditions, but actually we've we've traded through those market conditions. And I think, you know, we, we've, we've proven it this year. that We know that we, we can, you know, we can continue on that path. Mm. You keep coming back to time and time and time again, having great people within the business. And you can feel that, you know, engaging with 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 South Essex and and, and Katie was lovely when we spoke uh, the other day. Um, there is obviously a very collaborative, uh, inclusive, uh, consultative culture within within the business and, and and you can feel that just in talking to you so I think that's one of the hardest things of any business to get right is to get the people and that is an iterative process and you'll you'll learn as you go and things will work or won't work or the next best thing turns out to be the worst thing and uh, you see it all the time it's, in, it's insane yeah. one final question for you obviously you guys have uh, delegated authority for a number you know presumably across all your schemes mm -hmm. So that sort of underwriting function, as it were, is be there's an awful lot of PE money and, and, and the likes going into AI um, and supporting, if not doing some of those functions. Yeah. Are you guys, have you got like an R&D team? Are you looking at any of this kind of stuff? Is it on the radar? Very uh, good question. I think... Um one of that that kind of area is something where the group has to, to come in um, because across not only SCIB but the other um, businesses in, in the group, um, we control an awful lot of, of scheme business. And I think we're probably at different stages of that journey in, in different teams. This again is where it comes down to, to not just learning from within your own business, but it's learning from the wider group um, and what ecclesiastical can, can bring into that as, as well. So um, do we look at the next trends? Do we look at the next technologies? Absolutely. I think we, you know, as, as leaders, we spend a lot of time um, investigating and engaging with different partners and different businesses that would potentially bring, you know, something else and another solution for us. I think, again, you know, the, one of the things I really value about SEIB is we are quite a traditional broker in the sense that we really value the people input and what they do. So, um, you know, are we ever going to replace our people by machines? No, not at all. Are we going to look at technologies that give us um, a chance to service our customers and look after our insurance partners better than, than of course? You know, we we spend a lot of time uh, and a lot of, actually a lot of our, um, our teams are set up around um, having really quality MI um, and our MI is a lot better than quite often than insurer MI. Um, and that's, that again, is something that I'm really positive in joining the business. So, you know, it's just the next stage of that. It's the next stage of how we engage. Absolutely, we're looking at, at different at different solutions. Um, but will it replace the human touch? Not at all, no, because that's that's what we're bloody good at here. Do you know what? I think, um, so I had a conversation with somebody yesterday that was really interesting. We were talking about the cliche of the changing world of sales, right? Or yeah. the changing world of buyer behavior and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I say cliche because we've been talking about this for years, you know, before even, you know, probably when I was still at school, there were people talking about, oh, everything's going to change. You've got to move with the times. You've got to be there. You've got to do that. And I think particularly for the insurance broking market, relationships are so important. And you don't sell complex commercial insurance on a, a digital marketing website. Um, and, and I think there's a bit of a misnomer uh, in, in terms of people's understanding uh, of, of, of that. You know, I'm, an, I'm a relationship-based person person that's what I do and I think where what my challenge is um, is to develop that to go yeah absolutely but what technology and digital marketing and podcasting and um, you know um, all of these things can do is can can build uh, can build that relationship before 
you've even got face to face. So it's just about using what the expected um, <clears throat> Yeah. channels are to build that so just you've kind of just hit the nail on the head there we we how can you bolster that relationship how can you make it more uh, you know solid and and valuable I, I totally agree and i think you know the the ethos of seib since barry set it up in 1963 um has been around offering advice and support for customers that, that need it i mean we, we create a solution to a problem that was there i mean barry wrote the first horse insurance policies that, that were out there we're very very passionate about following that through and, and giving customers advice and support and i think you know we've, we've got a big team at seib and we'll continue to have a big team because we, we've got a lot of customers to, to service and i think we're very passionate about that and um, people's buying habits have obviously changed the way that people operate and actually people's habits have changed even in the last six seven months there hasn't been certainly in my lifetime a bigger change in terms of the way people are operating thinking about things than we've seen over the last the last few months and that with that we need to make sure that we're evolving with that but not making knee-jerk um you know decisions thinking we know better or this has happened so therefore so one thing we've, we've literally just gone live with right now is we've, we've sent out a survey to our customers and to customers that we didn't win as well actually just to say look you know how do you want to be serviced by SEIB? What what do you really value from us now? But but what do you want to do in future? How could that change? So we invest a lot in in e-trade. Um, you know we we work with customers um, digitally as as well as 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 over the phone and face to face, obviously. But um, we don't think we know everything. You know we know we've built a business model on relationships and face to face and telephone uh, based management of our customers. But we know there's other ways of doing it as well. So I think we'll continue to evolve and and learn. But I think the most important thing we have to to do is make sure we listen to our customers and what they want is what we'll do and that's how we'll evolve. I'm going to use what you just said there because because you've articulated what I couldn't in the conversation I had yesterday. It's not about the transactional nature of, of insurance broking that's going to change. It's about the way people buy and even that's changed incredibly. If you just think about this conversation being over and in fact all the conversations we've had over Zoom, that would never have happened six, seven months ago. So so I think that's really, really incredible. So um, I, I'm really, I've really enjoyed that, Gary. I really enjoyed listening to what you guys are doing. I think we've got very... Um, aligned mindset in 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 terms of the things we've talked about and um and it's been really interesting so thank you very very much for your time my pleasure no problem at all